it's been uh, contaminated, so I don't need to worry about touching it. We would we would never do this with the samples from Benu. We would handle them with uh, tweezers, but this one's just for practice. But this is a carbonaceous uh, meteorite chip here. Oh, oh, I need steady a second. I need to get a shadow. And, and again, what is that? So this is a, a carbonaceous meteorite called Allende, uh, landed in Mexico, 1969, the same year as Murchison. Uh, it's uh, two weight percent organic carbon, contains organic compounds, um, including uh, the building blocks of life. So this is the type of material that will uh, get back uh, from Bennu, asteroid Bennu in 2023. So I'm going to demonstrate the crushing procedure that we use for these samples. We use uh, clean ceramic mortars and uh, pestles as we place the sample in tubes, glass test tubes. First we have Pyrex glass test tube, common in any chemistry lab here. And we scoop up some of our meteorite sample, dump in the tube. Typically we'll analyze, you know, maybe a hundred milligrams or so, so something like that. Very small amount, you don't need much. There's a lot of organic material in these uh, carbonaceous meteorites. So again, the mission itself where we turn 60 grams, you know, we need less than 0.1 gram to, to make these uh, organic measurements. The next step is to add the water and seal it so that we can do the extraction and make our meteorite tea and extract all the, the organic good stuff. I use a pipetter for that. clean uh, pipette tips and then we have uh, clean distilled uh, water again we don't want to contaminate the meteorite so we very clean water and we only need about a milliliter of, of, of liquid don't need much we just add it directly to the to the meteorite in the test tube so that's that um, the next step is to flame seal the tube and do our extraction. I actually do that over the other side of the lab. Okay, so that's our uh, propane burning. That's not hot enough to, to melt glass. So we add a little bit of oxygen. Just cracking it open a little bit here. You can see the flame. Pretty much melt there. Okay. Now we're ready to seal. The sealing process is pretty quick. We first melt the. I don't want to get my fingers too close to the flame because it will burn the gloves. So I use this pipette tip to get a little more distance. Then we just rotate. You can see the glass starting to melt. Voila! Sealed meteorite in the test tube. So the next step after this will be to put this in an oven at 100 degrees Celsius. And uh, after 24 degrees, uh, very cold, so we can you know, preserve samples. We have multiple shells here. Um, and you can see these are actual you know, extracts of meteorites uh, that we've analyzed over the years. We keep extracts from the lunar samples from the moon. We've got our even the stardust extracts from the comet mission still in here. And can you actually pull that out so we can actually see? Does it say like S T R D S T? What do you want to see? A vial that actually oh, says hey, <laughs> Stardust number five. Oh, okay. I'd have to. Stardust may be in the back. It's been since 2006. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna have to do some digging for that, to be honest. But uh, um, these are actually some. Uh, so we also do contamination control analysis for the Stardust, uh, for the OSIRIS-REx mission. So we, they have these witness foils that right. we extract, and a lot of these files are frankly from that uh, analysis. So this is 19U, 
done it on 8.4. Um, so we'll take a vial like this. We'll take this one. And we'll let it melt. Uh, let me go over here and show you. So basically we'll take our extract and we'll put it inside our sample analysis tray here. Again, this is also a liquid chromatography tool. Uh, the way that works is basically fluid gets injected into uh, columns uh, that we basically keep at a fixed temperature. The organic compounds will separate as a function of, you know, basically hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, so how soluble they are in water. They get pushed through these columns uh, and then detected by mass using a mass spectrometer. This is a time of flight mass spectrometer. Um, this is actually the same instrument we use to detect the amino acid glycine in the stardust materials. Uh, very sensitive technique. You don't need much material at all. Um, and then, you know, out spits out the data. Uh, so here you see a bunch of uh, peaks. Each peak is an amino acid um, that we can, you know, measure the area under the curve and get a concentration. And one of the unique things about our approach is we can also separate out uh, the enantiomers of amino acids. So we're made up of 20 amino acids. Um, glycine is achiral, but the other 19 are chiral. So you come with left and right-handed. And the interesting thing about life is it's basically only the left-handed form that's used. And we think this is a universal property of life. Um, now, most meteorites uh, have equal mixtures of left and right-handed forms. Racemic. Yeah, racemic, good. Um, and that's because when you do these reactions non-biologically, there's no preference over one over the other. Um, What's been really fascinating is as we've uh, looked at some of these more rare meteorites, like the Tagish Lake meteorite, we found some amino acids have large left-handed excesses over the right-handed form to the tune of 60% more left-handed. And we think this might be an indication of that prebiotic chemistry. Uh, maybe the origin of homochirality was actually sparked by the delivery of these left-handed bias meteorites to the early Earth. So it's something we're, we're still working out. We don't quite understand why there's this huge left-handed bias, but using a technique like this, we can actually measure both left and right-handed forms and, and try to figure it out.